Our task in this video is to now see how we can use the harmonic oscillator model to go from something like looking at the structure of a water molecule to predicting that there are three vibrational frequencies which are unique and would be observed in an IR spectrum for a water molecule at these given uh, frequencies here. So let's describe our problem. We've got a water molecule. It's got three atoms, so that's three nuclei. And in terms of molecular vibrations, we're interested in the motion of the movement in the positions of the nuclei. So for the oxygen, it's got three coordinates, an X, Y, and a Z in the R vector for the oxygen. For hydrogen one, it's got X, Y, and Z. Hydrogen two has X, Y, and Z. So for, if we have N atoms, we're going to have a total of three N coordinates, or nine in this case, for water. And then we can represent these coordinates as a vector which contains all of these uh, individual vectors or to just put all the coordinates, all nine coordinates on equal footing, just a vector from x1 all the way to x3n or x9 in this case. Then our potential energy function is going to be some function of all of these nine coordinates. And these nine coordinates will give us a nine-dimensional potential energy surface. So this potential energy surface, in general, uh, we would get from some type of electronic structure theory calculation. There are several commercial packages available for that, but that's not the topic of this video. We're interested in how we go from uh, the idea that there is this 3N dimensional potential energy surface to predicting uh, what type of vibrational frequencies we would see. Okay, so if we have if we have this structure here of, say, a water molecule, we're interested in a point where the gradient of this potential is equal to zero. So the gradient would be, in this case, for a three-n-dimensional molecule, sum from i equals one to three n, the derivative of v of r with respect to xi, all nine coordinates here, that that sum is equal to zero. And this is true that the derivative is zero at, at every single point. So this would be a minimum, not minimum, what minimum, minimum energy geometry, or also called a stationary point on the potential energy surface, stationary point. Although stationary point in general does not necessarily refer to minima, just refers to places where the gradient is zero. Could also be transition states and those sorts of things. Okay, so if we expand this potential energy function as a Taylor series, as we have so often loved to do with harmonic oscillators, we will have a term for where we just have um, some the equilibrium geometry so let's say r naught where all of these coordinates are at values where a minimum energy results where a stationary point results plus and then we're interested in displacements from that the taylor series of a multi-dimensional function would first include a linear term which would look like for all three n coordinates the derivative of the potential with respect to that individual coordinate times the, that individual coordinate's displacement from its equilibrium position, or the point at which we are expanding the Taylor series, which is the equi equilibrium position here. Then plus another term, not sure I'm going to fit there, so I'm going to go down here, which is the second order term in the Taylor series, which is a double sum from i equals 1 to 3n and j equals 1 to 3n of the second derivative of v with respect to coordinate i and coordinate j times x i minus x i naught times x j minus x j naught. Okay, so this is all on the same line here. But there are some simplifications we can make. Um, the zero of ener energy is arbitrary, so we can just set this equilibrium uh, energy to be zero. We can define zero to be the equilibrium energy. That's perfectly fine. 
We already said we're at a minimum energy geometry or a stationary point, so the gradient for, with respect to all dimensions is zero as well. And since we're in the process of defining things to be equal to zero, let's just go ahead and define the equilibrium position of any of these coordinates to be zero as well. Not worry about that exactly. Okay, so that just leaves us with this second order term here that we're mainly looking at that we're going to go forward with from there. Okay, and then just a point of note, these set of second derivatives with respect to coordinate i and coordinate j, those can be defined as h i j, and then these h i j are elements of what we would call big H, which is called the Hessian matrix. So these Hij are elements of this Hessian matrix, which is a 3n by 3n matrix of these second derivatives with respect to these uh, coordinates here. So that's about as far as we can go uh, looking at things this way, but what we can do is instead transform to a system of coordinates which is much more useful for our purposes. So instead we're going to move to the set of so-called normal coordinates which we're going to call Q. So there's going to be a set of normal coordinates Q. And in Q there are going to be three n normal modes and if we describe each of them there are going to be three translations so those don't contribute to vibrations because it's just all molecules moving in concert with each other they can move up the x-axis the y-axis or the z-axis there are going to be three rotations noting that there would only be two if linear so kind of put the asterisk there there's only two if you're linear so then what are you left with? You're left with 3n minus 6 vibrations. And also note the asterisk there, it's 3n minus 5 if the molecule is linear. But the vast majority of molecules are not linear, so we're going to talk about 3n minus 6 from here on out. Okay, so our potential energy function is just going to be v of the set of normal modes Q is equal to one half. Oh, forgot there's a one half in here because of Taylor series, one over two factorial. There's one half the sum of I equals one to three N minus six, because there's not going to be any contribution from rotations or translations. Those are going to be pretty much free. And then what we can call hi times qi squared. So the, the displacement of that normal mode from equilibrium squared times hi, and these hi are, we're gonna get are the uh, eigenvalues of this Hessian matrix. The normal, the normal coordinates, the normal modes are the eigenvectors of this Hessian matrix, and these values here are the the eigenvalues. We're going to leave it at that because that's again not the focus of this video, but the point is we can we get these uh, two things here which are analogous to the harmonic oscillator potential, one half kx squared, one half hq squared. So then moving on from there we can basically define a Hamiltonian for each of these individual normal modes. So we can have the, the vibrational Hamiltonian equals a sum from i equals 1 to 3n minus 6 of minus h bar squared over some reduced mass for the ith normal mode second derivative with respect to that normal mode plus one half our potential that constant hi the spring constant for that m normal mode times the times qi squared. So this is, as we saw in the 
previous video, separable for each normal mode, it's, it's reducible into a sum of a Hamiltonian for each individual normal mode, so we can solve each normal mode individually, and each of these normal modes, you should just recognize that this is the Hamiltonian for a harmonic oscillator. So our vibrational energy, our final result, our, it's not the color I wanted, I want this color our vibrational energy is a sum of all 3n minus 6 normal modes and if once we solve that we would get h nu i where uh, nu i is the vibrational frequency for that mode times n i plus one half and this is our final result for these energies and let's remind ourselves that ni, every the set of all of them, each ni starts at zero and goes up. And similarly, we have that these nu i are equal to one over two pi square root of k, or in our case, say h i over mu i. So there's some reduced mass for each mode. There's some there's some um, spring constant for each mode, which we get from the eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix, which are the second der mixed second derivatives of the potential with respect to nuclear motion. So for water, th n is 3, so 3n minus 6 is 3. And the three vibrational frequencies you get for water are 1595 wave numbers, 3657 wave numbers, 3756 wave numbers, and the three normal modes are the familiar, if you've ever seen uh, any class on group theory or anything like that. There is a symmetric stretch where the hydrogens stretch out together. There is an asymmetric stretch where, uh, this is not drawn correctly, one of these should be going out. Let's have one of those going out and the other going in. And the bending mode where the hydrogens kind of rock in and it forms kind of this scissor motion back and forth. So it's just very analogous to the entire harmonic oscillator model. It's just that's the case for each normal mode, and each mode has a zero-point vibrational energy, has a unique frequency, and the same basic mathematical machinery that we've been applying to uh, single vibrations for, for diatomics. They are linear, so you have 3n minus 5 and n equals 1, so 3n minus 5, or sorry, n equals 2, 3n minus 5 is 1. So for diatomics, you just have one normal mode, which is the vibration of that one bond. But this, this type of idea is readily extensible to polyatomics. And the same types of ideas about zero-point vibrational energies, uh, their contributions to how they change dissociation, things like vibrational frequency and harmonic corrections, all those same things apply to real, real molecular systems.